Welcome. I want to begin by firstly thanking Lindsay for coming all the way. A lot of people ask me, how do you get Lindsay Fox to come and speak? Well, I listened to Lindsay's video and he talks about persistence. He talks about not accepting no as an answer. My wife doesn't go along with that. <laughs> <laughs> and he said to me, he said on the video, if you fail once, try again. It only took me three years. But you know what? He said yes right away. So I want to thank Lindsay for coming and agreeing to speak here. I met Lindsay through a, um, a very, very dear mutual friend. For those who don't know, one of the hats I wear is an organization called Chabad Yud, and every couple of years we run what's called a parade, a Jewish festival, and we needed trucks. And Lindsay is synonymous with trucks. So I called up my dear friend, Mr. Izzy Herzog, of blessed memory, and I said, um, Izzy, I need some trucks. Where can I get trucks from? He said, leave it to me. A minute later, he calls me up and said, Mr. Lindsay Fox said, you've got your trucks, how many do you need? And so, sure enough, um, these extraordinary, beautiful foxes, you're passing another fox, rocked up, and um, it was incredible, and we had our trucks for our parade, and that's how we started the relationship. So, thank you for those trucks, and um, it's great to always see, whenever we're driving down the highway, we're passing another fox, we know we're in good company. I want to I want to thank um, our host Daniel Hausman from KPMG, one of the senior partners over here, and Daniel will be sh sharing a few words. I also want to thank my partners in crime, Zaman over there from CBRE. Zaman, you can stand up. Say hi. He doesn't want to stand up. Yehuda in the front row. Say hi, Yehuda Gottlieb, and Brian Berger over there. Brian, you're the awesome man, and thank you for all your hard work. And it goes without saying that I want to thank. As Lindsay correctly said, the most beautiful lady in the room, my dear wife, thank you, Dina. Yes. Now, this is not planned, and we've never done this at a YGP event, but I felt a need to do this. And you're going to have to just indulge me for two minutes, because a lot of people ask me, how do we put on these events time and time again, our Friday night dinners, our social gatherings, who helps us, who makes it happen, how does it all work? And I want to tell you that there's three people who, each of them came in their own right, who are here tonight, that I specifically want to pay tribute to them. I want to thank each and every one of them because they partner us, they enable us to do what we do, and they believe in what we do. And in no specific order, I want to first thank, sitting in the front row over here, and in Greg Ross Handler, who, I want to tell you something that the terminology mensch Right, which you're going to probably hear a lot about, is understated in you, Greg. And Greg is one of our partners who enable us to keep doing this. Greg has nachas when he sees hundreds of young people together. And I've got this tiny little thank you that I want to give you on behalf of all of us. And I want to say thank you for partnering us, thank you for believing in us, and thank you for enabling us to do what we do. Thank you, Greg. The other one is someone that is extremely, extremely dear to me, sitting here in the front row. Um, I don't want to share the whole story, but I just want to, I will say this before we get into the emotional story. If anybody needs an insurance company, the best insurance company, hands down, is Scott Winton Group, unbashfully. Support Scott Winton Group, they are a great insurance company. And I just want to say to Sarla, who runs Scott Winton, and Sarla has been one of our partners for years with a dear late husband, Ronnie. And um, Sarla, thank you. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your support. Thank you for believing in what we do. And thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Zalman said I can't give you a hug, so. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, as I said, in no specific order, and I don't even see him, but I know he's here. Jeff, where are you? Where's Jeff? There, one of my closest and dearest friends, really. When I met you, Jeff, my life was forever positively changed. And um, Jeff also, just, I want to tell you something. Jeff comes to our building and he looks around and he sees the young faces and he joins us at our dinners. 
And he says, this is beautiful. This is nachas. So Jeff and his wife's not here tonight. She's at home. But, and Annie, thank you, thank you, thank you for partnering us and enabling us to do what we do. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> you know, I want to just, on your seat, if you looked around, and I'm just going to pick this up. We've got so many more events coming up. Get involved. Get engaged. Get inspired. Brian and I always talk about that at YGP, it's about meeting new people, it's about networking, and that's what tonight is about. So please, we've got another few workshops, we've got Shabbat dinners coming up, feel free, Dean and I look forward to welcoming you at our next event. And I just want to leave you with a tiny, short message that we've just started in the Jewish calendar, the month of Adar, which is the most joyous and festive month. And what makes it so unique is that our great sage, our prophet, Moshe Moses, passed away, but also had his birthday. And listen to this, because I want to leave you with this. All of you young Jewish professionals, I want to leave you with this message. Some people want to focus on the negative, and some people choose to focus on the opportunity and the birth. Because the day he passed away was also the day he was born, believe it or not. His birthday and his death was on the same day. And we as a people choose to focus on the birth. We choose to focus on the opportunity. YGP is all about the next generation. It's all about the opportunity that we have it tonight. So welcome, get involved. We look forward to seeing you continue to grow with us as an organization. And we look forward to you mingling, meeting new friends, coming to our Shabbat dinners, having a great time. Now, it gives me great honor to introduce one of the senior directors of KPMG, a very, very, very dear friend of mine, Daniel Hausman, who also chairs the Yeshiva Beth Rivka School Committee and does an extraordinary job and doesn't get thanked enough. Thank you, Daniel. All yours. Thanks, Moshe, and thanks for the thanks for the very kind kind words. Um, I don't want to say a lot because you don't want to hear from me. You want to hear from uh, Lindsay tonight. But uh, I, I wanted to say that firstly, um, on behalf of KPMG, I wanted to welcome everyone here. I also want to want, wanted to welcome Lindsay, our uh, dear neighbour next door, amongst other things. Um, and um, we're, we're very proud for, from KPMG. We're very proud to be associated with YJP. Uh, we've got a big focus on, on our communities and on mentoring. As an organisation, we're pretty uh, invested in that. We've got an interest in it. We do hire a lot of young people, uh, a, lot of, a lot of young professionals, a lot of, a lot of young Jewish professionals too, as it turns out. And uh, so we're very supportive of any mentoring um, and career advice that people have to give. Um, I think I'm on the outer edge of, of what the YJP target market is. Um, I don't know what young cuts out at Moshi, but um, but uh, yeah, no, no, they're right. Um, but you know, as somebody who's had the had the benefit of, of uh, a lot of lot of mentors over the years, uh, I think it's something that we should abs absolutely be making available to people. I wanted to share a little little. Um, personal anecdote uh, from Lindsay. Uh, I was working, before joining KPMG, I was working at an organisation called Maine, uh, and we owned a little business called Armagard, um, which we, we sold off in 2003, uh, and I had the joy of separating off. Uh, Lindsay took it over, and I think Lynn Fox turned it into a profitable business in about a month, uh, <laughs> if I recall. Um, glad you stuffed it up. Yeah, that's exactly right. Someone had to turn it around. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so, so definitely somebody who's well, well, um, well suited amongst other things to career, give, give uh, career advice and mentoring. So uh, that's all I wanted to say tonight. Welcome and I uh, hope it's useful for everyone and enjoy the evening. And now it gives me great honour to introduce Yehuda, who is a partner at YJP, to introduce the guest of honour, Lindsay. Thanks, Moshi. Once again, it's a pleasure to be involved with YJP in coordinating another fantastic event, bringing together our friends and supporters for a night where we can learn and be inspired by one of Australia's most successful business personalities. Thank you to Daniel Hausman and KPMG for hosting us. And thank you to our dedicated team at YJP, Rabbi Moshi Khan, Zoman Ainsworth and Brian Berger. Of course, tonight would not be possible without our special guest, Mr. Lindsay Fox. Thank you so much for giving of your time to be with us tonight. A special mention of thanks must go to Ari Sass, who has been available for us at all hours for questions, advice and support. Thank you, Ari. Over a storied career, Mr. Lindsay Fox has created 
an iconic business in Lynn Fox and has been involved in the purchase of some irreplaceable Australian assets. Our vision at YJP is to build connections and to inspire our community to achieve greatness in all they do. I think with tonight's guest, you would agree that we have in our presence someone who is a living embodiment of this vision, a driven individual who has dedicated his life to achieving success in all that he has done. In an interesting way, Lindsay Fox has had an impact on pretty much everyone in this room, whether it be driving down the freeway and seeing one of his trucks zoom past, whether you've had a ride on the scenic railway at Luna Park, or been to the Grand Prix racetrack at Phillip Island. Personally, I've been lucky to have taken a few flights from his airport at Essendon Fields, and I've also had to schlep out to his other airport at Avalon. <laughs> Quite a contrast, let me tell you. <laughs> but that's just one example of how driven Lindsay Fox is. When some people achieve business success, they are satisfied with a private jet. With Lindsay, he's been driven. He's bought the jet, the helicopter, and not just one, but two airports as well. <laughs> Over the past few weeks, we have spoken to a number of people about Lindsay, and the one thing that has come through is, in all the stories is his generosity. Whether it be his philanthropic giving, the multiple offers to give people a lift in the chopper, the common thread has always been about how generous and giving he is. That's something we should all learn from and we can be inspired by. In recognition of these achievements in business and philanthropy, he was appointed an Officer of the Order of Australia in 1992 and further appointed a Companion to the Order of Australia in 2008. He's also been awarded the Centenary Medal by the Australian Government. But what might be less well known is that he's also played 20 games in the VFL for Sir Kilda in the late 50s and early 60s. He's always been ahead of his time. These days it's always become a rite of passage for entrepreneurs to drop out of college in order to achieve business success. Well, before Bill Gates, Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg did their thing, Lindsay Fox started the trend. But he topped them, not just by dropping out of college, but by dropping out of high school. <laughs> Despite this, he displayed the drive to build Lynn Fox truck by truck, starting with the first truck in 1956 to the business as it is today, with close to $3 billion of revenue and being one of the largest private logistics businesses in the world. We are privileged to have him presenting to us tonight in conversation with Zalman Ainsworth. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Lindsay Fox. Oh, good, I couldn't help but come. <laughs> but let me share with you something about my family. Katrina Fox is about 50. She's never been married. And she spends half the night on her computer looking up the history of the family. And we go back to about 1640 in the bloodline. But now the secret. With the DNA, I'm 50% Hebrew. And Solly Lou looked at me and said, I knew that all the time. <laughs> but I can start my story off fundamentally as once upon a time. We had, we grew up, when we came from Sydney as a four or five year old, my parents had room, a room in Johnson Street, Collingwood. And we lived in that one room in a boarding house. They shared a kitchen and the bathroom. And by the time we got to about five or six, we rented a house in Stewart Street, Windsor, 22 Stewart Street, Windsor, a little 15 foot frontage. And it went back about 50 to 60 feet. Three bedrooms, a lounge room, a passage down the side, a kitchen, and out the back was the bathroom. Now, the bathroom was fairly simple and fairly straightforward. It had a tin bath, not the fancy ones that we all jump in today. It had a little hero wood chip heater, which we cut up kindling and put paper in and put the timber to it, but then still had to control the flow of water so we could have a hot bath. Now all of these fundamentals come back to 
what makes you what you are, a combination of your teachers and your parents. And in my case, I can't speak highly enough of both the teachers at Melbourne High School and my parents. I was lucky to be an academic failure. <laughs> Two years in the second form, a year and a half in the third form, and I said, shit, I've got to get out of here. <laughs> so there was a wrecker of trucks in Richmond, E.V. Timms, who, as a 16-year-old kid, I negotiated buying an old truck off him. And it was four quarterly payments of £100, no interest, and I started my business. How do you get a licence at 16? You tell them you're 19 and they don't look for your birth certificate. <laughs> If you told them you were 18, you had to produce a birth certificate. So I found that out first and that's why I turned out 19. <laughs> Three years ago, I decided to put the record straight. I sent them a letter <laughs> and I said I was born on the 19th of April, 1937, not 34. Could you correct that on my licence? The letter came back, no, you're not. That's when you were born. <laughs> The bureaucracy that we live in. <laughs> but I, I guess all of the aspects of the education at home, my father brought people in off the street, total strangers. And on a Monday morning before I'd go to school, we often saw somebody sitting in the fireplace or alongside of the fireplace in the lounge room. And the lounge room was 12 feet by 10. And it had a fire. And these people were taken off the street. He didn't, he didn't know them. But they never had a roof over their head. Caring and sharing is one of the great ingredients that all of us should be involved with at all times. I've never heard of anyone going broke by giving. Somebody that's down and out that's the time to put the hand out of help. When they're high and they're on top of the world, they don't need anything. But when they're down and out, you should be there. And not lend them money, but give them money. Call it a starter. If you get one back out of ten, you've done well. But that doesn't matter. You gave it as a gift, not a loan. And believe me, the impact of that with people right throughout my life quite often just repeats itself. One fellow come back to me recently. He was an interesting character. I lent him some money and he apologised that he couldn't give it back at the moment. But he said, I, I must pay it back. He came back five years later and paid it back. And that's one case of seeing that how people turn around and see that this was a starter. I heard the words before of networking. I think networking is synthetic, a commodity that you can buy. You cannot buy friendship. Friendship you have to earn. Our relationships with all of our customers relate to them coming and breaking bread as you people do with your families at Shabbos on a Friday night. We do that during the week with our top customers. And my kids, when they were growing up, used to play a little banjo and, and sing. They all remember that. And some of those people I haven't worked with for 30 years. And now they're in old folks' homes. And I call on them and they can't believe it. But the depth of relationships are one of the most important things in our life. When we started, I bought, I think, my second truck off the Paran Council. And the person that sold, me, sold it to me was Israel Herzog. Now, Izzy was a unique character. And I, the one that created him to go into business for himself. 
because the people at Commercial Motors, a fellow called Bill Sturk, wouldn't give him commission, they, but they considered me as a young bloke a house account. So he said, screw you, and he went out on his own. And he never looked back. And his kids will vouch, and anybody that you as he hears of would appreciate that he was one of the finest men that God ever put blood into. But all of these things are about the various stages in your life. At 18, I went into national service. It was good for me. We were up there for three months. Uh, I made Bilko look like a goose. <laughs> I used to go and get all the food out the officer's mess. I got a key to where the food was kept and all the officers always wanted to come on my truck because when we'd go out on a bivouac, we'd have fillet steaks and barbecues <laughs> and fresh bread and butter and they never worked out that it was coming out of their kitchen. <laughs> At the age of 22, I married my wife, Paula, and that marriage is now 60 years old. She got a letter from the Queen, a letter from the Pope, and a letter from the Governor-General. You notice, I said, not we, I said she. <laughs> so she was 15, I was 16 when we started going together. And her mother wouldn't let her get married till she turned 21. But that, uh, that formed a, a, a partnership where we had six kids. Paula was a good Catholic, I was a careless Protestant, <laughs> and we had six kids in seven years. And the last child that came along, yeah, well, th they called it the rhythm system. I thought it was going up and down. <laughs> but Alan Kettle, who was our Sydney manager on the birth of the last child, sent us a telegram. Congratulations, Lindsay and Paula. You've pal. Congratulations, Paula. You've passed another fox. <laughs> <laughs> the formative years in our business, we carted my early days, coke from the West Melbourne Gas Works, just round the corner from here, or coal in 150 pound sacks. I used to carry roughly 12 ton in bags a day. It was a great exercise while I was playing football. And that went on for years. We used to take coal and briquettes in the winter time in deliveries, and then we moved in carting both Coca-Cola and Schweppes in the summer. So we had 12 months utilisation out of our trucks. And then came heating oil. So the solid fuels went out, and we finished up doing BP's heating oil from Newcastle to Sydney to Canberra to Wollongong and Melbourne. And that started uh, a great relationship that still goes today. Most of the customers that we deal with today have been with us for 50 years. And in my office I have a little sign as people walk out and they can look at it. And it says, if we don't look after our customers, someone else will. And every executive that, from Linfox that comes in, I tell them the same thing's applicable with their wife. <laughs> <laughs> you just were slow on that uptake. <laughs> so they're all basic fundamentals of, of where we started and what we've done. Um, in the early days, I ran the business on the basis of having cash in the till, not worrying about profit because I had no accountancy background and uh, as long as I did that, I, I'd be okay. So we had to, to, had to use the corner store philosophy. You always needed to have some cash in the bank and we kept that up all the time. Um, Rex Davidson, for any of the older people here who headed up the ANZ Bank as the finance director, he, uh, he gave me a facility 
when I was about 26 of $300,000. And I used to go up to six and seven hundred. <laughs> I did. So he sent out one of his boys to bring me in and meet with him. And he blasted the hell out of me. And then he dismissed the boy that brought me in and then looked at me in the eyes and said, what do you need? <laughs> that was an old style banker that dealt with people up with integrity and on the basis of the colour of their eyes and the way he felt about you. Without the support of people like that and all the people we dealt with, the first thing I learnt in business was cash flow. If the blood stops flowing in your body, you hit the ground. If cash stops coming into your business, the business is dead. So I used to have arrangements where people like Dunlop, who supplied me the tyres, BP, the, the fuel to drive the trucks, I was allowed to pay them 90 days. They gave me that sort of credit. But they paid me for the cartage every seven days. <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> and um, once again, they were looking after somebody that they saw some sort of future in. I was fortunate enough to have all of these things happen in relationships with people where they came and ate the bread at our table. And they understood the family, the aspects of integrity, and the relationship, the relationship has gone on 20, 30, 40 years after I stopped doing any business with them. And that's, that's one of the nice things about our, our whole aspect of, of business. 1978, we were covering every state in Australia. We started early that period doing the work for, Coca for Coles and we put our first truck on a three-month trial. We finished up with all of their business. Today they spend about $350 million with us. A year later, we started with Woolworths. We've been doing Woolworths work for that sort of period. In the next 12 months, we'll do over 600 million with them. And it all relates to personal acceptance and belief. If you believe, it's amazing what you can do. All my life, I've wanted to take another step. I've never been content. I get into trouble from my missus because if I wake up at 5 o'clock, I go to work. There's nothing I do, I just go to work. <laughs> and just mosey about to get a feel of what's going on. Um, 19 or 2000, we uh, took over all the Olympic logistics for in Sydney and that was a, a great opportunity to show the capacity of what we could do on a grand scale. Um, in 2003, we bought Main Nicholas, which was a 130-year-old transport company, and Armour Guard, which carts about, oh, probably $200 billion a year. And in, they had about 85, 90% of the market. A very good organisation. 2007, we moved into Asia Pacific and India. We operate in I think 12 economies around the world today. I think we have about 36,000 people on the payroll. We pay about $3, billion, $3, $3 million a day wages, 365 days a year. Now, as I said, it is like a dream. It's a fairy tale. When you think of the numbers and look at it today, um, it's very hard to understand how you've done it when you started with no money at all, other than the people that were prepared to support and back you 
to put you in a position where you could do these things. We, we've been through the mining boom where we've got road trains with three 50-foot trailers on the back counting all over Western Australia. Uh, we did the Olympic Dam, Barrow Island, uh, Chevron Gas, and I think we have 250 road trains on the, on the road today. And all of this really be, became possible but because we have an imm imm immaculate safety record. The police say that they'll only ride their motorbike alongside of one of our trucks because they're very comfortable that the people are going to do the right thing. I was in our office a um, couple of days ago and in the lift there was a sign, 3,642 days with no accidents. Uh, how many people at Essendon Airport? In compliance? Or no, no, in, in the operation. Uh, 340. Yeah, so they've had no accidents in over three years. And this is because of the standards we set. You will never see a dirty Lynn Fox truck. My son, who's the chairman of the company, gets on the phone if he sees a dirty truck, tells him to pull it off the road and get it washed. We have a zero policy of no drugs, no liquor, no speeding. So if you want to feel comfortable, you will see all the way through with what we do there, it's 100% in the interests of everyone on the road. We have 16,000 training days per annum where people get instructed in safety and all the things about doing the right thing. We emphasise all the time you can't do wrong doing right. And you find that if there's been an accident on the road, our people that are in that vicinity, they'll be there to help. The company has always stood by the words a promise made is a debt unpaid. And we stick to that rigidly. If we make a statement that we'll do something, we fulfil that at all times. Um, I've spent the last five years in the most painful job I've ever had, and it's called succession planning. <laughs> your own obsolescence and the direction that your family need to take and how to cut up the cake. We didn't have that problem when my father died. We had to borrow 200 pound to bury him. My kids aren't going to have that problem. But this is one of the things that you go through in the stages of life. When we uh, look at the armour guard business, I think we've got about 600 trucks and about 1,500 38 revolvers. No, 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 they're not. Berettas. We bought the 18-shot Berettas because there's a lot of bad people about to die. We're the largest user of uh, the toll roads. We're the second largest on the intermodal rail, moving goods all over Australia by rail. We travel 675 miles per annum. And we've never had the government knock on the door and ask, what should we do about congestion, the traffic? Our fuel bill's about $200 million a year. And I get pissed off because half of that goes in tax, which was supposed to eliminate congestion. <laughs> but it finishes up in the consolidated budget, not where it was meant to go by paying that sort of money. Every, every gallon of fuel you buy, 50% of it goes in taxes to the government to eliminate congestion. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about politics. <laughs> we have uh, got to the stage in carbon emissions that we've re reduced it by 36% since 2006, or 2006 levels. Lost time in accidents, we've had 90% 90, 90 reduction. We own and operate two airports. 
and they'll feed the grandkids for the next 50 years. <laughs> we have 250 warehouses the size of the Melbourne cricket ground. You, you may ask, how did we do it? By believing in yourself and being prepared to get off your backside and make things happen. I use and have always used what I call the till principle. T is for trust, I is for integrity, and L is for loyalty. They're the base ingredients that you need to have all the people that work for you understanding and being prepared to follow it. Trust, integrity, and loyalty. I guess as an individual, you need to know your strengths and your weaknesses. All of you guys that have got a shave, some of you don't. Some of it you don't. When you look in the mirror, that's when you should be able to talk to the fellow that you see and analyse your own weaknesses. In my case, there were plenty of them. But I always engaged people to do the jobs in all of the areas of my weakness that were twice as good as me. They all became an integral part of the business going forward. Ari gave me this, this speech I made how long ago? 15 years ago. 15 years ago. <laughs> and it's still applicable today. <laughs> Our customer has always been blue chip. Had to be in business 10 years from today, but most importantly, they had to pay their bills every seven days. It's a bit more difficult today. The suppliers of our trucks, tyres, spare parts, fuel and insurance have been with us in most cases for 40 or 50 years. Cash flow I covered before, BP I've covered. Mark Twain sums it up pretty well when he said the harder you work, the luckier you become. I believe in that very much so. One of the important things in work is job satisfaction. Can you imagine making love the second time if you got no satisfaction? <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> All of those push-ups. <laughs> Another one that Henry Ford said, which is very good. If you think you can, or you think you can't, you're right. So if you go in with a positive attitude, you'll win. If you don't believe you can at the start, don't even get to the start. Henry Ford was over 100 years ago. Uh, Australia's always been known as the lucky country, and we are lucky. I've been travelling the world since I, my first trip overseas was in 1961. I was on the border Continental Airlines in the United States, Morrison Knutson that built the Golden Gate Bridge and uh, the Hoover Dam. And I was in America every month for probably 10 years. And... The whole key to all of these things is the education you get by seeing these things. I'm going to put you all to a test. I want you to follow me. Make a C with your fingers. Come on. Come on, big C. Put it up. Right. Now touch your chin. Come on. What did I tell you to do? What did I tell you to do? I can't hear you. The only people that touch their chin are blind or lawyers. <laughs> and I, I knew I wasn't at a legal convention. <laughs> I guess I'm proud to be an Australian and I recall vividly at Paran State School on a Monday morning when they'd unfurled the flag. And as they unfurled the flag, they'd beat the kettle drums. We put our hand on our heart, like you see the Americans do. I love God and my country. 
I'll honour the flag and I'll serve my parents and honour the customs and the laws. The politicians took that out of the agenda at state schools. I love God and my country. I honour the flag, serve the king and cheerfully obey my parents, teachers and the lords. At 83 years ago, I first heard that when I was eight, 75 years ago. When I said to you first, I missed a couple of words, but the old ticking machine went back. I had to repeat myself so I could get it out. Ari, <laughs> you can have it now. <laughs> Next 15 years. Now, after all of that, feel free to ask me any question about any aspect of either my life or my experiences, and you will get an open book reply. And if we can, we're going to invite you to sit down for the Q&A. No, I'm not going to sit here. <laughs> I want to stand up. Zaman, but Zaman is going to chair our first few questions, and then we'll open it to the floor. So Zaman Ainsworth, all yours. He'll sit down. <laughs> I'll tell you what, he's a good learner. <laughs> you sure? No, I'm not going to sit out. <laughs> I haven't got piles. <laughs> I'll just keep it short then. Um, first of all, thank you for doing this. We really appreciate it. Clearly everyone's here to hear you speak. As I said, the fee was worth coming. Yeah, <laughs> I can say over time. Um, is it true that you go by another name called Label Lindsay Fox? And where did that name come from? Uh, Solly Lou looked it up and I was listening a reference earlier about Moses. Did you know he lived to 100 and Swansea? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you have many close ties with the Jewish community over the last 50 years. Are there yeah. any characters or stories that stick out? I was a defender. There was uh, the best example I can give you. My daughter, the kids up the road, three houses up the road, were Jewish. And my daughter said to this Jewish boy, Jewy Pooey. And I marched her down to the house and made her apologise to the parents. She finished up marrying the Jew. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? When they did the bris, on my grandson, they were too short of a minion. <laughs> and you know what I had to do? Ring up Izzy Herzog in Australia and said, Izzy, I need two Jews. <laughs> so they came in with the ringlets, the hats, the long lot, and in they come. And they went ahead and gave the kids a snip. <laughs> then, for his bar mitzvah, who do you think had the scroll? The one that's not a Jew. And I can prove it if I have to drop my pen. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to carry the scroll at the synagogue in New York. And all my Jewish friends said, don't drop it or we won't be able to eat for a month. <laughs> so I grew up with the Jewish kids in the street. And I went on to Melbourne High School where Melbourne High School had 40% of the kids of Jewish origin, or Jewish parents. And it was a melting pot. And most of those people today that went to that school were top doctors, top lawyers, and terrific people. And that's always been part of my fabric, all of those people, right throughout my life. Um, you're 82 years old, and according to <coughs> close people around you, you have about $4 million in the bank. And you haven't slowed down at all, but rather gone faster. So when's it going to actually be enough? A few more north wouldn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> what keeps you hungry now, and did that work for you 30 years ago? Um, money is a byproduct of job satisfaction. 
and it's tremendously important that you enjoy what you're doing. The things that make me happy when I have total harmony throughout my family. And when you go through the process of trying to work out your estate, my Jewish lawyers, Arnold Block and Leela, <laughs> They said, sell the business and give them the money. <laughs> I said, uh, now this, my business is like one of my children. And I'm never going to throw the children to the bar. So that's something I've worked on for five years. But money is, money is like uh, fire. A great servant and a dreadful master. And you come across all of these things in periods of your life. If I was a footballer today, at 83 in six weeks' time, I'd be in time on. So in the period I've got from now till when I get my bed to, with six foot of earth, I will keep on keeping on, taking the challenge, doing the things that people say are impossible. I got a great deal of satisfaction out of raising 280 million for the Anzac celebration. I used the principle of what a fellow called Jack Lieben showed me oh, 40 odd years ago. He lived in the street round the corner and I was on the board of the Peter McCallum Clinic with Mark Beeson and because Jack was a hard nut they gave Jack to me to go and get some money for him. <laughs> so I knocked on the door, his wife opened it, we sat in the, the lounge five yards down from the door on the right hand side. And he said, what do you want, Lindsay? <coughs> I said, uh, Jack, I've been given your name to get some money for the first cat scanner at the Peter McCallum Hospital. How much did you put in? <laughs> I said, 25000 Put me down, the same, got a bottle of scotch, the kind. <laughs> <laughs> that education gave the fund for the Anzac $280 million. All the banks, I got $10 million a piece of. All the miners, I got $10 million a piece. I got a million out of 17 of the top 20 wealthy people in Australia. And all on what I learned from Jack Lieberman, put in yourself, people will follow. So you never go broke by giving. For young professionals and entrepreneurs in the room that would like to do business with you, yep. instead of running another YJP event, how else can they get into your office? You got a job for me. That's all. <laughs> How have you managed to keep such amazing relationships with faceless companies who've had more CEOs in the last 60 years than you can remember, but yet they're still using Lynn Fox? Service. How long have you been married? 12 years. Well, you'll understand it. <laughs> I'll tell you what, a lot of you were picked up on that straight away. <laughs> What do you rate more in people, loyalty or ability? Loyalty. Do you have more than one word answers? <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving you the opportunity to get rid of all that stuff in front of you. <laughs> you and Solomon Lil have a famous relationship. What's the one story that really sticks out? And what happened with Dan said? <laughs> uh, okay. Solly was my next door neighbour and um, we were closer than pepper and salt in those early days of our relationship. Uh, we're still great friends, but Ansett was one of the hardest jobs I've ever tried to put together. But the Prime Minister wouldn't let us land at Sydney Airport. Him and a fellow called Max the Axe, who was his henchman. Now, 
I was lucky that we never got it. Because if we had it, I wouldn't have been able to buy main Nicholas. And the main Nicholas put the icing on the Lin Fox cake. And all of a sudden, we doubled our business in one hit. So I paid uh, John Howard's library trust. I had two professors from Canberra come and see me. And I said uh, they wanted 500000 And I said, I don't like the man but I'll honour his position and I gave him $100,000 because it's a library for a Prime Minister and whether you like them or not to take on the job as Prime Minister of Australia is as tough a job as you can get. They try. Sometimes they're people that you wouldn't employ to take the top job. My senior executives get more money. In fact, our truck drivers make as much as a politician. <laughs> Ministers, our middle management, make more than them. And the Prime Minister and the Treasurer, our top, our top people get two or three times what they get paid. So can't you remember the old thing? Feed, peanuts, and what do you get? Monkeys. Somebody's right out there. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine tomorrow morning you woke up and you were 32 years old and you had no money. What would you do then? I'm a realist. <laughs> <laughs> but if you had to start over again, where would you start? Well, Knowing what you know now. I think, how do you make a small fortune is the typical answer to that. How do you make a small fortune? Start, start, with, a big one. One. start with a big one. Inheritors have got the greatest problem of the lot. They don't know what it's like to get the kindling to light the fire. They like to turn the switch on to get the air conditioning flowing. And until you've been in that situation, you never appreciate it. And to show you how I feel about it, that little house I told you about, where I grew up, I bought it three years ago for one and a half million. And I put my first great grandchild and her husband in there until they outgrew it. To prove to them from little acorns, oak trees grow. And they were there. She had to pay $30,000 a year rent. She was there for two years and they needed a bit more space because a baby came along and I gave her back the 60000 because I know if she, I gave it for nothing, she would have wasted that 60000 But she got that 60000 to go towards the house for her to build her own home. It's empty at the moment. I've thought of moving back myself. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any questions from the crowd before I continue? We have yeah. Sam Tarasco is a very good friend of YJP. Could you tell yeah. us a bit about your relationship and buying his company? Yes, yeah, Sam was going broke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was. And we bought his business off him for $100 million. And uh, ever since then, he's concentrated on property. If you've got a toothache, you go to your doctor. Where do you go? Your dentist. The dentist is correct. And if you've got an appendix, do you go to your dentist? Who do you go to? The doctor is correct. People think that dealing with unions and things that you don't understand, you will lose your pants. Sam moved into property and he's made a tremendous success of it. And congratulations. Do you want to ask yep. um, your legacy. What, yes. what, what would you like to be remembered for in a couple of generations of what you've been able to achieve in your life? Well, at Melbourne High School, as I said, I was the worst student they ever had. But I bought the library for them. <laughs> and they wanted to call it the Lindsay Fox Library. And I rejected that. So you know what the principal did? On one of the columns at the side of the building, 
they put a gargoyle with my head on it. <laughs> now every one of the kids that goes to Melbourne High know who the gargoyle is. Well, what do you want to be remembered for? What's your, what's your byline? What do, you, what, I, what do you want uh, to be known no. for for what you've done? Uh, I enjoy doing things that people don't have a clue about. Mm -hmm. Lloyd Williams and I bought the first stroke ambulance. <coughs> and this stroke ambulance... Um, I went over to Germany where they, they started using them. I've got a meeting next week or the week after with the Minister for Health in uh, New South Wales. Lloyd and I bought it for a couple of million dollars. It saved in the first year something like, I think, $1,400 with a stroke. It's essential that you get to the hospital within the first half hour. But with a CAT scanner, there are three medicos in the ambulance and you get in the CAT scanner and by the time you get to the hospital they know exactly what to do. But you won't see any names on the, the ambulance, voids or mine, and all the things that you need to do in life, you don't have to advertise. The best is word of mouth by people and your experiences that you do. The moment you stop doing that, it's a great pleasure. My wife's just doing a, um, a melanoma clinic. Bought a property in St Kilda Road, backing onto the Alfred. She had three melanomas and I think she's raised 140 million. And only about four or five people were all coming to the party. Nobody's got their name in lights. This is for the community. So you don't need to tell people you could. People say you should do this. I say, I don't have to. I've got 7,000 trucks with my name on it. <laughs> just wanted to ask, how do you balance such wealth with raising children and finding the right balance to teach them? You know, obviously you can provide them a great lifestyle, but I think values and what's, you know, all the other things that are really important to teaching children. How well, do you young Nissen was Andrew. Andrew, Andrew how balanced are my kids? You've grown up with them all your life. As balanced as Andrew? <laughs> no, I wouldn't let my kids have hair that long. <laughs> but Michael's father would be the doctor at St Kilda when I played there. And I've seen the family grow up from when they were this high and where Mike, he, he put his hand on a heater and he had scar tissues all over his head. He was that big when I first met him. Rob, um, tell us about these driverless trucks, uh, Vincent. How's that going to affect your business? Have you ever closed your eyes? Have you ever closed your eyes while you've had your head in front of you and your hands on the steering wheel? No. Well, have another scotch. <laughs> um, driverless trucks. We've got some coming out from Sweden later this year. I'm going to Germany on the weekend to look at the latest technology in Mercedes-Benz. The Vol Volvo are sending out two of these electric trucks. They work terrific in the mines where they do a circuit and they can't kill anyone. But to have a fully loaded truck and trailer combination uh, without somebody behind the wheel, there's a lot of deaths there. And Look, it might come with electronics these days, even in the car I drive. There's a, a switch you can put on so that if you come up to 50 feet from another car, it puts the brakes on. So there is certainly technology coming. But whoever thought we'd ever put a man on the moon? So certainly there's, there's potential, but not during my lifetime. <laughs> Marrying my wife. <laughs> no, no. Toughest decision. No, I think any 
time I've got to take decisions that are tough, I say, what's the upside and what's the downside? And when I sort that bit out, I then act and either go on with it or drop it. They're the only tough decisions. Yeah? You spoke very highly about Belmont High and teachers in general and yeah. education, and yet you dropped out of school. Can you share a little bit of that? Well, one of the interesting things was the high form master at Melbourne High School, his name was Wilbur Cordes in Form 3C. He went on to become the economics master, Scotch. And my kids all went to private school. The boys went to uh, Scotch and the girls went to Mandela. I married a Catholic and when I spoke to the priest, I had to christen all Catholics, uh, but I said I'm only going to do it on the basis I can send the boys to the Church of England school, the girls can go to the Catholic school. And uh, th that really came back to, I, I guess, getting the fundamentals right. Bit by bit. The, these aren't giant steps. <laughs> um, a, a lot of the things that you've done have been innovative or there wasn't anyone who did it before you. Who, who were your um, mentors or people that you looked up to or helped you in a way? My father was a typical Damon run this way. Um, he drove a truck to five pound a week and needed to get more, so he used to sell beer. On the weekend. Here in those days it was a pound a dozen. But to get any quantity, you have to either pay Dan Murphy or Doug Crittenden twice the amount. So my father got to the stage where he'd get a hundred dozen lots of beer and sell them on the weekend, make a hundred quid uh, Those were little things. But he was the one that was always there for somebody that was down and out to give him a hand. And my kids without being told for doing the same thing. Yes, dear. Sorry, we can't hear the question back here. Yeah. Yeah. You are no doubt a great man, but uh, I can't 
sounds good to repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> Greatest and greatest of everything in technology innovation as you've traveled around the world. If one of your grandchildren came to you and said, Granddad, I appreciate what you've given me in life and the opportunities, but I don't know what I want to do with my life now, what would you advise them? Go and get a job as a laborer. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. Understand the value of earning money. See, uh, you can say I'm sophisticated. I can dial a phone, I can answer a phone, but I have no idea how to text. I can't transfer things on my phone, but I know how to use the phone. So no text, I like to talk to people. Thank you. Yeah. Lindsay, earlier you mentioned that you bought a company for $100 million because of losing money. What's that? Earlier you mentioned that you bought a company I'm saying, I think that was the name. Someone's people were involved. I'm saying, Nicholas. Did you ever find yourself in a position where you felt like you were going to be in the same state? Never. <laughs> I was going to ask if you did, what did you do to turn it around? No, the, no, the simple assessment all the way through is know your strengths and know your weaknesses. And then if you're not sure, forget about it. If you're positive, Make sure that you cover the downside. What about industry change? A what? Industry change, when it's significant. Well, I have eight streams of business. So there's always seven of them firing. A V8 engine can run comfortably on six. A business can run well on seven. Yeah. We'll have time for last and final question. Just okay. because it's lead and lead means half. I've been waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lindsay, really good question. Did you ever set out to become rich? No. What motivated you to the next thing? A desire to have something a bit better. Nothing more than that. But to anticipate, as I said when I opened up my speech, I talked about once upon a time. I always wanted to take the next step, as far back as I can remember. But it had nothing to do with richness. It had the aspect of achieving the next step. And even now, at 83, I'm still looking for that next step. Can we please hear a round of applause? <laughs> <laughs> Not just trucking around. So you I know that, that could be confusing. <laughs> 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 May you continue to go from strength to strength. And here's a little book about the Jewish community in Melbourne. You probably even know some of the personalities. I'd be disappointed if I knew. <laughs> Thank you for the analogy 
once again, never miss an opportunity. So we do have more events coming up. We've got Jack Dan. We've got Jody Oscar coming up. Look on your chair. We've got some incredible. We've got a prayer party, a Shabbat dinner. We've also got, well, by the way, we've also got a great, great fundraising campaign coming up. So don't miss that. And thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming. Enjoy. Feel free to some more drinks. The good Jewish events. We have no food left. So thank you all. Thank you all. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>